Hi, welcome to the San Mateo Arboretum Society. I'm going to just tell you about some children's programs. We're doing a lot in April. Um, my name's Virginia. I'm one of the people doing the children's programs, and I also volunteer in the Arboretum. So right now, when you leave, you'll see our story stroll is in progress. And so every Saturday and Sunday until the last weekend in April, um, we'll have a story stroll for pretty much any age child from like two, three, up to about 12. And there's a book that's on boards and you go around and you read the book and then there's a quiz that they do and they either submit their name and um, contact info into uh, a drawing for books. Um, and that's free and it's kind of self-propelled the parents help out. And then next Saturday, so kind of as a follow-up to this, but it's a little, little bit different, we're doing a family gardening workshop. So that's for kids. It says eight and up, but you can be like six. And um, we're going to be making little pots out of newspaper and then doing planting seeds um, for a variety of uh, plants. And those, that particular program is involved with a, a project or a, um, what do you call it? A, a, workshop that they, the library got grant for a grant, that the work library got a grant for to do these two programs. So we're working with the library. Um, and for those of you who don't know, we have a great library over on Third Avenue within walking distance. And then at the end of April, we're doing a um, gnome and uh, garden mobile program. So that's for that you have to register for, it's free. But these you have to register for, but they're free. And, um, Kids love to do it. Um, so all that information is on this form as well. So now I'll turn you over to Pat. We'll tell you all the other, all the other important details. <laughs> Good afternoon and welcome to the San Mateo Arboretum Society Zoom seminar, Organic uh, Summer Vegetable Gardening with Lisa and Kathleen Putnam, their sisters, by the way. <laughs> um, program will last approximately 90 minutes, maybe a little more. Uh, feel free to submit questions. I guess I can take this off. Um, feel free to submit questions. If you're on Zoom, you can use the chat button at the bottom of your screen, or um, if you're in person, just raise your hand and we'll work through the questions. Um, before we start, a little bit of information about what's going on at the Arboretum. Our nursery is open um, on Saturday and Sunday from 12 to 3 and um, weather permitting, and it hasn't really been permitting lately too much, but um, entries at the North Gate and payment is credit card or debit or Apple Pay, and we don't accept cash. Um, <clears throat> while you're in the park, um, visit the Rose Garden, the Butterfly Hummingbird Garden, and the our new demonstration gardens. They're not that new now, but um, they're all tended and cared for by uh, to San Mateo Arboretum volunteers. Um, we also have um, an art show going on. Um, as you can see, people who are here, these are San Mateo High School students. Um, it's a project and the art program is open uh, Saturdays and Sundays, 10 to three. Um, as I said, our workshop presenters are Lisa and Kathleen. Um, a little bit about their um, bios. Lisa has uh, a BS in agricultural economics from UC Davis, and she also studied uh, nutrition science at Davis. Um, she currently manages a small sustainable organic farm in Woodside and Portola Valley, and is a UC master gardener and master composter. Um, Lisa's passion is soil and compost. Along with her sister Kathleen, she has been teaching gardening at Lingso's San Mateo County Fair, and various garden clubs for the last 12 years. And Kathleen has a certificate in environmental horticulture from City College of San Francisco. She's also a mass UC master gardener. Um, she's a um, professional organic vegetable gardener serving in the mid peninsula and is um, an ISA certified arborist. Kathleen's passion is fruit trees and soil. So now I will Turn it over to Lisa and Kathleen. Thank you. Thanks very much, Pat, for the nice introduction. Um, we were while we're on camera, we were just going to go through tools really quickly, and then we'll go into the slide presentation. But um, so Kathleen and I carry our tools differently. I carry mine in a basket. Kathleen has this soil, this whatever it is, 
holster. Holster. <laughs> so I just carry mine on my pants. Yeah, and it's always with me. Yeah. Um, and really the tool, and we actually have a slide on this, but these are by AR, ARS. And I like them because they release when you click them. And especially when you're like reaching up and you're holding on to a branch, it's hard to unhook your, or unclick your pruner. So these, I love these, it's a one hand operation. Yeah, but these are a great brand. Felco is another good brand. We kind of stay away from the big box brands just because it's a lifetime investment. You can, you can sharpen them. And Kathleen, you want to show them the sharpener? Yeah. And you can buy a new blade. So every once in a while I do buy a new blade and it's easy. Even I'm technically challenged, but even I can change the blade on it. And then you just sharpen it. So these might be $60 and maybe the ones in the big box store are 20, 20, but really you can have them for, for your whole life. So, and what I used to do, Kathleen has corrected me, um, a, a, a trick to keep these sharp and Kathleen sharpens hers when she's pruning. Once but, every, yeah, about every hour. Once an hour, I sharpen mine less often, but you can put just a little Sharpie on the blade and then it's just like sharpening. And this is the sharpener. And the only place when Orchard Supply Hardware was open, <coughs> excuse me, they used to sell these, but the only place I have found them now is at AM Leonard's. Their, um, their website is amleo.com and they have all kinds of great stuff. So you just go till all the Sharpie is off and it's just at a pretty flat angle. That's what I was doing wrong before I was going at too steep of an angle. Um, the other thing I always carry with me is a soil knife. And this is another one that Kathleen turned me on to. I used to use a hand trowel. Mine's a little bit dirty. Yeah, but I love my soil knife and also it has six inches. So, I mean, you can use it if, you, let's say you're planting your broccoli a foot apart. You can just put a broccoli here, put a broccoli here. And it, so it's just really easy. The plant to plant, you go in, pull towards yourself, pop the plant. It should take you maybe two seconds to plant a plant. Um, maybe five. Five seconds? One, two, three. Well, yeah, you know. Yeah. Okay, five seconds. Okay. <laughs> this is another thing. Oh, mine's dirty. I know why, because I just took out a row of broccoli. Um, this is the pocket boy. So when I'm pruning, I use really, I think the only three things you need other than the sharpener are these three things. Yeah. So gardening is not expensive. You know, after you have your three things, and we'll talk about how we don't use inputs in the garden. We grow everything from seed. So garden can be very inexpensive. And this, you just go like this, watch for your fingers and, and put it away. And then it can go in your pocket. Oh, the name of the sharpener is DMT. Um, and what's, well, here, I'll just show you. What's really nice about this sharpener is it's a triangle. So you can get, see how it's, I've bought the ones that are um, rectangular and you can't get it into where you do most of your cutting is right here on the blade. And the ones that are not triangular, you can't get in there. I was doing the wrong side. <laughs> <laughs> and these last, these last me about a year. And when you start to feel, when it starts to just kind of glide and you don't feel any kind of sharpening, any resistance, it's time for a new one. And they're, they're not cheap, they're about $35. Yeah, but I always get one in my Christmas stocking. Yeah, they're indispensable. So it's DMT at AM Leonard. Did you have the package? Uh, yes, I did. The only other thing I use a lot of, these are landscape staples and you can buy inexpensive ones. Here's the kind that you would get kind of at a big box store and you see how it's all corroded and like rusty. And this, this one's from um, Urban Farmer in the city in San Francisco. And they're made out of stainless steel, I think. Stainless steel like or galvanized. So yeah. it doesn't ever rust. 
the reason why I like these, well, because they never rust, but like if you're putting a floating row cover or something and you need to put landscape staples, um, you don't tear up your, your floating row cover with these. These, after they get all rusty, they're, they're gross and uh, hard to use. So to hold down irrigation lines, to hold down floating row cover. Um, that's pretty much it. That's, yeah, that's pretty yeah, much for all. For netting. And it's also nice because you're gonna pull your irrigation lines up three times a year. Yeah. So it's nice to not be fighting the staples every time you pull up your irrigation lines. Yeah, exactly. And then the only other thing is a hat and sunscreen. <laughs> I know. My doctor told me I need to wear sunscreen. Yeah, I bet. Plus your ears. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. All right. Well, we can go on to the presentation now. Thank you to our technical team, Kathy and Kevin. All right. There we are. Um, so that's me at the farm with my hat on. <laughs> and I have the same t shirt on today because my t shirt's funny. It says, Are there enough plants? Yeah. I have enough plants and it said, said no one ever. Um, there's no such thing as enough plants. Um, so that's the, that's the farm and wood side. We do, and you'll hear today, we do a cover cropping system and we do a no till gardening. Um, you can see all these flowers growing and stuff we put out. Our cover crop is California wildflower seeds. Um, and the idea there, and again, we'll go into this, is always keep your soil covered. So we don't ever have bare soil. It's either covered with mulch, living mulch, chop and drop. And this is what we use for our cover crop is California cover crop seeds um, by Nature Seed. And they're out of Utah or Larners. I use a lot of seeds. Um, from a small company in Bolinas called Larner's Seed. Okay, next slide. Um, <laughs> and I don't even know the office was so three. I'm not sure what's here. Mm -hmm. And there we are. So starting, um, so the farm, I used to farm where I'm farming now uh, from 15 years ago to to about 10 years ago. And then for five years, it was not being farmed. So we took it back May 7th last year. So it's only been, it hasn't quite been a year yet. And I think you will be amazed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so you can see on, on the left-hand side, no, on your right-hand side, that's where we started. We now have five more rows here. I've now expanded it. But after three months, um, literally just three months, our cover crop are going crazy, our cucumbers are going crazy, our tomatoes. Um, I have been working on the soil for 15 years. So it's not like, but the point with this slide is you can go from zero to 50 in, you know, in five seconds. Um, next slide. Um, uh, the first thing we did was plant cover crops. So the very first thing we did is throw up cover crops and cover our soil. So we had alfalfa and grass, um, so we covered our soil with that after we threw out cover crop seeds. We planted out our tomatoes because we were starting in May, May 7th is when we started. Um, and so we were a little behind. That's just the earliest we could start because of an issue. But um, so we were a little behind. Usually I like to put my tomatoes in um, April 15th, but they caught up. So it wasn't a problem. And I'm working with about 10 master gardeners and some non-master gardeners. Brian. In the slide there is our gopher guy. And uh, we've got gophers, we've got rats, we've got squirrels, we have moles, we've got bulls, we've got, uh, we got it all pretty much, I'd say. Lots yeah. and lots of birds. Um, and that's typical. Um, so you can, we'll talk about that later too. You can, exclusion is what we mostly do. Um, anything on that slide I need to say? Uh, Compost pile. Oh, is there a pocket? You see? Oh, my compost in the middle slide. You can see my compost pile. Was we do everything with compost. We don't do any fertilization other than compost. All right, next slide. Um. Yeah. So we seeded corn in May. We harvested in August, and then we planted that out. We when we take a crop out, we never pull anything out by the roots. We just that's, that's why my saw is dirty right now. I just took out a row of broccoli 
um, which broccoli, the stem can get like this. You can't do it with a hand pruner. You have to do it with a saw. But we sawed down all that corn. We put in cabbage and within, oh gosh, 60 to 90 days, then we harvested all our cabbage. Then we put that into, right now it has garlic and scallions and onions in those particular three rows. So um, one thing with gardening is you're just always thinking six months ahead of, okay, uh, and we'll talk about this too, but tomatoes, you wanna pre-seed with two crops of broccoli. So you're gonna do a fall crop of broccoli, a spring crop of broccoli, and that's where you're gonna be planting your tomatoes. So you're just always having to think ahead of um, what's going where and why. And then we'll talk about rotation. So you said you never pull the roots. Yeah. If you had a diseased plant, do you pull the roots? The UC guide is to pull roots if you have verticillium. Mm. So I haven't had verticillium. Um, you know, when we took out those tomatoes with verticillium, we did not pull the roots out. We no, just, I know. We're going to find out this summer. Yeah. <laughs> um, we'll talk a little bit about some diseases that like only that family tomato gets. I can't think of a plant where I have pulled out the roots. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I always leave roots in um, to feed the soil. Onions? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Root crops. You got me. Um, radishes. Beets, onions, <laughs> radish, carrot. Yeah. Rutabaga, turnips. <laughs> <laughs> Pull out those roots. All those, those little root hairs are staying in there, but not the root. Um, all right, next slide. Um, cover crop, chop and drop. So the, the main thing I would like to impart on you today is, um, so with your cover crop, and the cover crop can be anything. What a cover crop is, is just putting a living mulch onto that soil. So your soil isn't exposed to rain and sun and things that are gonna beat down on it and kill the microbes in that soil and also make it hard as a rock. So you always wanna have living roots in your soil. Um, I did several rows with grasses as my cover crop and man, that was those were the, my nicest rows of broccoli that I've ever had. And granted, I'm working with 10 master gardeners. So we have a lot of, manpower. Um, so we chop and drop that grass grows like crazy. So we're chopping and dropping it and chopping and dropping. You just, you take your head shears and you just work your way down the plant and you just let what you have just chopped fall to the ground and be a green mulch. Yeah. So it's just, you, you have both a living mulch and a green mulch going at the same time because you're not taking the grass out. You're just chopping it off, leaving those roots in place to feed all the microbes. And like Kathleen said, then all those little pieces, you're cutting it into one to two inch little pieces and they just all fall in place, covering your soil, keeping it cool. And so the sun isn't beating on it and the, the rain's not beating on it. I will say at this farm, we've had, I don't know what, 12 atmospheric rivers. Um, we had no puddling. We had, we had excellent infiltration. And I think it's because everything's either covered with mulch, all the paths are covered with mulch or it's covered with living mulch for your plants. Well, I just read something interesting in weed management ah. that when you plant your tomatoes, plant lettuce in between mm. and the, the lettuce will suppress the weeds mm. and it doesn't get big enough to stop the sunlight from getting to the tomato. Yeah. And then, you know, in yeah. a month you, you eat the lettuce and your tomatoes continue to grow. Yeah. This year for the first time I, I did, I put my, I plant my tomatoes like five feet apart, but I put broccoli and then where my cage is gonna go, yeah. I put um, sugar snap peas in a round thing and then broccoli, sugar snap peas. So, and I thought, okay, well then my tomato cage, the sugar snap peas will grow up, protect the tomato till the tomato's big enough. By that time it's time for the, piece to come out and but that's the kind of thinking is always just thinking ahead um, of what's going to go where and why and utilizing the space as, as well as you can yeah yeah uh chop and drop um so i'll just we're going to talk about cover cropping a little bit more but um 
it's really a cover crop is to feed the soil, not the human. So you can grow anything in the cover crop. You can grow radishes and you often do. You could grow lettuce, you could do, but then you're gonna chop and drop it. So it's feeding the soil and not the person. So you're not taking any biomass off of the soil when it's a cover crop, but you can grow anything as a, like I can see in this slide right here and have mustard as a cover. There's my hat again. Uh, I've got mustard as a cover crop in there and I'm not gonna eat that mustard, the soil is. So, okay, next. I'm just gonna go through these slides quickly and I'm not. Because <laughs> this isn't the meat of the, um, and I just planted, well, um, not just, but this is, yeah, October. Um, I planted a hedgerow of California natives because they had them on sale. <laughs> they had them on sale at Filoli. So, oh God, I'm such a sucker. But um, I mean, I knew I wanted to do a hedgerow anyway. And so, if you plant California natives around your vegetable garden and you're bringing in all the good insects, and you've always said, um, you know, it's like 95% of insects are good. Oh, 98. Yeah, but, and I just heard 99. Yeah. So <laughs> people talk about pest control. Well, 99% of what you're seeing are good or neutral. 1% are bad. So please keep that in your mind when you're thinking about spraying or pesticides or... And Doug Tallamy, I just, I don't know if you guys heard Doug Tallamy, but he's a deep thinker on planting natives and things. If all insects died, like all, we had no more insects on planet Earth, within months we would all die. Yeah, we obviously have to have them for pollination. We need insects. We need insects. A lot of people. Oh, there's Doug right there. <laughs> Speak of the devil. I forgot to. Um, so he has written a book, um, Nature Will Save Us. Yeah. Uh, he, he's great. If you haven't heard of Doug Townley, just look him up and go to his YouTube and just give yourself a favor of an hour of watching what he has to say. He's a professor from University of Delaware and he's He's my new, I get these gurus and I get these garden crushes. Like <laughs> it's amazing how I can get a crush if somebody's a gardener. I'm like, oh I know. God. I will follow you anywhere. Gay Brown in North Dakota is my crush. <laughs> <laughs> Can't help it. Oh God. Uh, anyway, he's um, he's amazing and, and I'll go into how I want to be the Doug Tallamy of vegetable gardening, but he's he's plant natives, plant super local. That's his thing because we want to keep our insects healthy, which are going to keep our birds healthy, which are going to keep our mammals healthy, which are going to keep us healthy. So um, anyway, he's, he's fabulous. Okay, next slide. Uh, from seeds. Oh, there we are. Put my safe t-shirt. Um, <laughs> so we room. start everything from seed just because it is a, it's a, it's a decent sized farm and it would be too expensive to buy seedlings. And we'll do a little seedling demonstration afterwards, but um, that's a seeding. I think the point of this slide is just make sure you've got everything on hand when you're um, when you go to the nursery and you look and you see all these beautiful things and you're just so tempted to buy them all. You know, make sure at home you've got your compost and you, you've got your irrigation system in and you have your you know you have everything you need so you don't get home and you're like oh shoot I don't have everything I need to I can't put these in the ground right now. So all right. Uh, yeah, I have one hard and fast rule. I don't plant anything and walk away from it without making sure there's irrigation to it. Yeah, yeah. No, that's smart. That's really smart. Um, and these rows right here, those are the rows that I added. And I that's we cover crop those with grasses. And those are broccoli. It was the best broccoli and the most productive broccoli I've ever had. So I and I, I attribute it to the cover crop the of super fibrous roots. So the roots are amazing. Yeah, grass roots are they wild. Go down like eight feet and, and sequester a ton of carbon. Okay, next slide. Um, <laughs> there's my <laughs> compost pile and that's my good friend, Luis. So um, because it's larger scale, we compost everything from the property. And all it is is stuff from the property. It's just leaves and grass trimmings and, um, when I, when I cut off those plants, they go and everything just goes into the compost pile. It all just sits there for about three months, not doing anything. And then we add water and we add air. Then we turn it with a tractor and we add water. And within a few weeks, uh, we have amazing, amazing compost. And that's probably three week old compost. Now it gets better with time, just like women and wine. 
Um, <laughs> so it, the, the longer you let that sit, you know, six month compost is going to be better than three week compost. One year compost is going to be better than six month compost. So um, we do screen it. That's me screening it. Um, if we're going to be using it for seeding mix or if we're going to be doing a root crop, if we're doing carrots or, or a root crop, because it still can be a little chunky. Um, so we'll screen it, but um, if we're just doing broccoli or what, we're not gonna- And look it. at the steam coming off that pile. Yeah. It's amazing. And those, are, so that's the bacteria breaking down the nitrogen and then it'll go into a fungal stage and the fungi are gonna be breaking down the carbon. All right. Oh, there's all our fruits and vegetables. So we grow a lot of, we grow a lot of produce at the farm and um, the, we're bringing it to food banks. So um, we feel like it's kind of a win-win because it's so often that a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables don't make it to food banks. So that's the purpose of the farm is to provide fruits and veggies to food banks. All right, and now we'll go into the class. That was not the class. That was just like, <laughs> <laughs> now we just want to go into the where, when, why. Uh, how to do it. How, how you do that. You too can do that. Anybody can do that. And you only need three things to do that. Sun, living soil, and water. Um, however, it does help if you have a few other things. And um, one of them is just a super curious mind. So that's why the little investigator is down there. Um, a heart is for patience. And then I think this is curiosity. Yeah, power of observation. Those things are super, super helpful. And the best gardeners I know are the ones who are very curious, always asking why, and um, um, observant, and very, very observant. So much of gardening is observation. And always learning. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, for leaf, uh, leaf and root vegetables, you need six hours of sun. For fruiting vegetables, which are actually fruits, they need at least eight hours. And that's true, six and eight hours. That means sun hitting their little solar panels, hitting their little leaves. Um, that's not dappled light. That's not, so just gotta be honest with yourself. Like Kathleen and I um, are professional vegetable gardeners, so we go to other people's houses too. And so many clients will say, oh yeah, I have full sun. And we go to their house and it'll be like noon. <laughs> and there's like, no, it's under a redwood tree <laughs> or, or an oak tree is, you know, 20 feet away or what, you know, or a house, you know, and it's hard, you know, I'm sorry, the rules are the rules. And um, what a plant needs is what a plant needs. Yeah, what a plant needs is what a plant needs. And it needs sun, that's what a plant needs. Cause it can't- You can't it, photosynthesize without it. It has to have sun to photosynthesize. That's how it gets, its, that's how it makes its food. Um, where to plant. So I personally, so this is, I live in Portola Valley and that's my house in Portola Valley and raised beds. And then that's the farm which is not in raised beds. I just took my raised beds out in Portola Valley, except for four of them. I personally much prefer in the ground. Um, you get, I don't know what I wish it was French, you, but you get the taste Terre of the soil. Moi. Terre de moi. Um, but you get the taste of the soil in your vegetables. The taste of earth. The taste of earth. And um, it's a lot less expensive harder to control. So rats, gophers, all that kind of stuff is harder in the ground. In a raised bed, you can put hardware cloth at the bottom, you can put covers over them. Um, uh, so it's a lot easier to control in a raised bed and you don't compact your soil because you don't walk on it. Um, anybody who has gardened with me knows. <laughs> don't, <laughs> not, don't walk on her soil. Don't step on my soil. You can step on wood chips, but do not step on my soil. If you want to see me go aphylactic, then step on my soil. <laughs> um, Microbes release as pets. Yeah. <laughs> no, I do. It's like stepping on my dog. You know, don't step on my dog. Don't step on my soil. That's how I feel. Oh, I stepped on my dog the other day. Oh, Kathleen. <laughs> I did. <laughs> His little foot. He's, he's just this big, and I stepped on his little foot. Oh, no, Theo. Yeah. Oh, oh, that happens. I mean, you know, but you try, <laughs> try not to step on your soil. Try not to step on your pet. Um, what, you, how about you take soil food web? Okay, so the, the soil food web is, this was done by Elaine Ingham, like, 
25 years ago. Yeah. yeah. She discovered there's all kinds of microbes and life in the soil. And it's all fed by plants. So the plant takes sun energy and converts it to chemical energy. It makes carbohydrates and it pumps 30 to 50% of that energy into the soil to feed all of the life that's in the soil. And the reason it does that is like the fungi, the, the plant will send out a hormone that tells that fungi, I need phosphorus today. And that fungi goes into the soil and it gets phosphorus and it brings it back and gives it to the plant. And the plant says, thank you. And it gives it some carbon. And it's just this whole amazing system, ecosystem that we had no idea existed you know, 30 years ago when we were just dumping miracle Grow everywhere, which kills everything in your soil. So that's the soil food book. Yeah, and it's super important. So we say at the farm, we grow soil and veggies are a nice byproduct. So mm -hmm. all I'm thinking about all the time is how to water my soil, how to feed my soil. I'm never, I've, it doesn't occur to me to try to feed the plant because I know the soil is gonna feed the plant as long as I take care of the soil. Um, okay, next slide. How do you do that? How do you feed your soil? Um, so we've talked about it. Um, and most of it is just keep your soil covered. Um, so you're not killing your microbes. If, if the sun and especially the rain just pound the heck out of that soil, they're gonna be killing the microbes in the soil. Um, do not rototill. So when you rototill, I just saw this. On TV form the other day, somebody's rototiller broke and broke, and I was like, oh, thank you. But they were trying to fix it. Like, no, don't do that. Um, but you can imagine you're slicing and dicing, you know, so all of these microbes and they stratify themselves. They know where they want to be and how much oxygen they need. So there's certain microbes in the top inch and then different microbes in the next inch, on and on. And so when you're rototilling it, you're just taking all their houses, turning them upside down and confusing them and killing them and slicing them and dicing them. So do not rototill. Um, we don't till at all. So we don't even turn our soil. So, and it makes for very lazy gardening um, <laughs> if you don't have to be turning. Yeah, but in soil. some ways, ways more difficult. Yeah, it causes other things that you need to do. I mean, the chopping and dropping actually takes a fair amount of time. Yeah. Um, but Kathleen worked in a garden for years where um, some other people were coming and turning her soil and she finally dropped the yeah. client because the soil was dead and the soil will turn into cement. I'll guarantee you if you're turning your soil, um, you're going to turn that soil like this table. You're going to turn it into cement. And then it was also full of weeds. Yeah, because I mean, field fine weed was everywhere because it loves disturbed soil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, okay, rotate your crop, grow diversity of plants, uh, feed your soil compost. So three times a year, I'm usually doing three different crops a year in the same row. Between each crop, I'm putting a little bit of compost. If you don't make your own, making your own is always gonna be your highest quality and best compost. If you don't make your own, you can go to Lingso and you can buy their um, distal structured compost. I'm starting to get totally away from horse compost. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's turkey, that's the distal turkey. Um, so that's, but I think bird compost is fine. Chicken, if you put chicken manure in your compost, I think that's fine. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put horse manure in your compost. Um, do, do keep your soil covered, growing in a raised bed, fill them with links. We do not work for Linkso, but they have really good products. Um, so I'd fill it with the Linkso veggie blend if you're doing raised beds and then just feed your compost three times a year. You wouldn't go out naked. Don't let your soil be naked. Can I tell my Lingso veggie blend story? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had a, a client in, uh, in Woodside and we decided she wanted to grow vegetables. So we decided where to plant, where to build the raised bed. She wanted raised beds. And I filled it with Lingso veggie blend. And about six months later, she was very angry. <laughs> and I was like, you know, what's, what's the problem? She said, it's too productive. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I've never had that complaint before, but yeah. 
she couldn't eat it all. I'm like, well, give it to your friends. Yeah, there's places where you can, there's places that'll take it. Um, all right, uh, why feed the soil? We've kind of gone into this, but um, so while you're keeping all those roots in the ground, which are adding, those roots, by the way, are organic matter. So the easiest way to add organic matter to your soil is grow a cover crop because all those roots are organic matter. And when you cut that cover crop off, more carbon is going to be pumped in there and you're going to add more organic matter. Um, so you in, add organic matter. That's uh, why you're increasing your soil organisms. You're increasing your water holding capacity a great deal. So once you have high organic matter in your soil, um, the water is going to stay like a, like a reservoir in, in the soil a lot longer. Um, infiltration, you probably have seen where it rains and it rains onto soil and the rain just stays on top and almost balls up. Um, so if you have, if you're feeding, keeping that soil food web alive, that water is just gonna percolate down and then the microbes in their little bodies are gonna hold some of the water and the roots are gonna hold water. And that's why you have much better um, water holding capacity. Most importantly, you go. And, and the main reason why you're keeping your soil healthy is it's going to create a very healthy plant. And, oh, did I take that? Oh, I think I took the slide out. But- um, What a nutritious plant. Yeah, it's a super nutrition. When you grow it organically, like in really super, super healthy soil, the nutrient content, and this has been proven, the nutrient content is much, much higher than something you go buy uh, from a grocery store. Um, and, and then also once you're, if you're giving that plant everything it needs, the soil that it needs, the sun, the water that it needs, your plant's gonna be super healthy. And I mean, knock on wood. Um, <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, um, uh, now I thought, now I knocked on wood, but um, <laughs> now I can't remember. You're gonna have a super healthy plant. Super healthy plant. And you're not gonna need pesticides, herbicides, insecticides and yeah i think what i was going to say in, in at the farm we don't have pests we just that was the knocking on the wood we don't have pests now that could change but i think we're giving the plants exactly what they want and we don't have pests unless that plant's about to die when when a broccoli a kale when anything's about to die they are broadcasting to the world i'm about to die and then you are going to get aphids um that's just the life cycle. And who cares? I don't care if you get aphids then. You're not going to eat it because it's going to seed. It's bitter. Um, so you wouldn't eat it. Um, so great. Okay. Uh, soil management from Gabe Brown. Oh, that's your crush. That's you should talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, disturb the soil as little as possible. Always have living plants. Grow a diversity of plants and plant families, not just plants, but um, different plant families. Uh, cover crop as much as you can. And he says incorporate animals. I mean, he's a farmer. So after he does a big field with cover crop, he lets his cattle in there and they, you know, munch it all down and poop it all out. And it's wonderful for a soil. Yeah. And I will say, and his big thing is carbon is key. And when you're doing all this, you're just pumping carbon into your soil. When you chop and drop, you're just pumping carbon into that soil. I think our soils here, my observation is we have plenty of nitrogen. Yeah. We do not need to be feeding. We do not need fertilizers. Um, there's plenty of nitrogen in the soil. We need to recarbonize our soil. That's a big problem. Um, these are some people we like. Um, I mean, Alan Savory also, but if you haven't read Dirt to Soil by Gabe Brown, it's a great book. If you haven't, I think everybody at the beginning of the pandemic watched Kiss the Ground, but if you haven't, it's not too late. I think it's Netflix, not sure, but yeah, I think so. that's well worth watching. Um, Chris Nichols, uh, Christine Jones is my other, like, yeah. Uh, she's in Australia, but she's amazing. She's she's really who I follow the most, I would say. She's a soil scientist. And then Christine Olson, all, actually all three of those women are soil scientists and they're all amazing. Um, and Kathleen and I, it was way before the pandemic, we went to visit Singing Frog Farm up in um, Sebastopol. It's a no-till farm, market farmers. So they're making a living. They're feeding their family um, by, by farming. And they're a, a large, uh, well, eight acres, <laughs> no-till farm. Um, and you can go visit them. It's fun.
um, benefits of cover cropping. We have kind of beaten yeah. this horse to death. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Here, I will just say, do it. Yeah, um, it's good. Roots in the ground, <laughs> not boots on the ground. One thing I would say, don't put a legume in your cover crop mix. Yeah. You don't need it. There's enough nitrogen in the soil. In fact, they recently discovered a free living bacteria that converts nitrogen um, in the air into plant available nitri nitrate, whatever it is. Um, so you don't need a legume. And yeah. legume, just don't do it. <laughs> there you go. And those are a couple of our, what Kathleen showed you nature seed, because I, I use that a lot uh, for California native wildflowers. Larner seed, I really like Larner seed. Yeah. Peaceful Valley, but whatever, they've got seeds. You know, Peaceful Valley has a really nice cover crop chart. Yeah. That you could go use their chart and then buy the seeds somewhere else. <laughs> Yeah, they're well, commercialized. Just a thought. <laughs> they, they, they've monetized organic farming. Yeah. That's, that's fine, but um, rotate your crops. So rotate your families. I, I do think this is important. I think you and I have gone back and forth a little bit on this, but- um, Really? It, oh, you know, maybe it was something else that we didn't agree with. Oh, oh yeah, I, never mind. Um, <laughs> But I think Kathleen already said is have four or five plant families. Um, and the more, the better. Yeah, the more, the better. And then I, I crossed off. So for, for my cover crop mixing, um, I crossed off legumes and I crossed off veg. Don't do veg. Um, oh my God, I still have veg. Veg just will take over the whole world. That's what I'm convinced. Um, maybe we should do desertification. And <laughs> um, but yeah. Um, but you don't want to do cucumbers and you don't want to do the cucumber family in the same spot year after year. You don't want to do the tomato solantia family in the same spot year after year. Um, if you only have one bed and if you have growing a tomato and let's say one raised bed that's this size. If you grow your tomato and eggplant and pepper here one year, then move it over there and grow your cucumbers or your beans. Um, so just make sure you're rotating crop and not planting the exact same thing in the exact same place year after year, because you will build up um, disease. Does it, yeah, some problematic um, bacteria or fungi in your soil. Um, alrighty. Uh, irrigation, why don't you do irrigation? Okay, drip irrigation is the, um, I think it's the best way to go, especially with vegetables. I have drip in my whole house, my whole yard. <laughs> um, I really like Urban Farmer up in San Francisco, not to plug anyone specific, but the Ewing in San Carlos, they're not kind to women who don't know the name of everything. So just keep that in mind. And Horizon's not bad. Horizon in Menlo Park is pretty good. Um, but yeah, drip's easy to install. In fact, if you go to Urban Farmer's website, they have how to, they have a, a diagram of how to install it from a spigot if you already had it, or even if you have irrigation in your lawn, you can take one of those and go irrigate something else nearby with this certain head. Um, and closed loop, we, we don't know why. Yeah, a lot of people we've noticed when they have raised beds, they they run, um, and I see it mostly with Netafim, but they they run it and then they go back into Here. the pipe. Um, Give me your sharpie. Okay. Yeah. Um, oh, it's the people at home you can't see this. That's okay. Uh, oh, we can show this. We we'll hold now. See, but we're not on the camera now. It's okay. I'm gonna hold it up. No, the camera's not on. Oh. Okay. Well, these people can see it. This sharpie sucks. Well, I have another sharpie. Oh, don't. I think it's like not good for you. You want the sharpie? No, it's too late. <laughs> okay. So this is how a lot of people do it. Hang on. The camera's down. Oh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Well, because the sharpie, no one can see it. So you see, it goes all the way around the main line, and then they run their little lines between it. And what we do, and especially if 
every <laughs> if, if three times a year you're going to be removing your irrigation lines it's almost impossible to remove those lines on a closed system yeah and you're constantly taking your line you know you're always moving your lines out moving your lines back in so you want to have thank you the left side not the right side yeah oh well now the left this well, one yeah. you want this <laughs> one not this one yeah so this one it's super easy to, to pull those lines out this one it's it's like major work to pull out those lines and when you add compost and when you mulch you want to pull the lines out you want to pull put the stuff in and then put the irrigation on top of it that's how you're going to get the highest benefit to your plants is if the irrigation water goes through the mulch and the compost and then it gets to the plant so pull your lines out put in your compost and your mulch plant your plant or put the lines back in actually and then plant your plants and you're good to go yeah and come throughout your cover uh okay oh and wait the clock so i used to work uh, at a um i used to actually work at the orchard up in south san francisco in the nursery and people would come into me all the time you know my plants really yellow or it's really this or it's really that and my first question was always how much water mm -hmm. is it getting and Probably about half the people would say, well, it's on drip, it's on a clock. I'm like, well, that doesn't tell me anything. <laughs> I mean, what's the clock set to? How long is it running? And what season is it? So you need, you need to know where your clock is and how to program it and how to adjust it. Or if you have a gardener, make sure your gardener knows where your clock is, how to adjust it and how long, you know, because the seasons change in the winter, you don't want your irrigation running a half hour every three days, especially yeah. this winter. Yeah. So, and in October, you start decreasing, and I hope not to turn my irrigation on probably for a couple more months. We'll see. Yeah. See how hot it like there's 80s predicted like a week from now or something. So we'll see. But there's so much water in the in the soil right now that it'll last us for a while. So three seasons. The when, where, why, we're now at the when. Okay. Um, think of gardening in three seasons. So I, I think I kind of said that, but you get to take December and January off kind of, and you get to kind of take July off. Um, oh, unless you have fruit trees. Yeah, that's true, that's <laughs> true. But so right now, I mean, um, so February is kind of go to like December, January, you can start getting your beds ready. You can start putting your compost on. And then when February hits, your brassicas are going in. You're, Broccoli, kale, cabbage, cauliflower, uh, and then also your chinope daisy, your carrots, beets, carrots, beets, chard, spinach. Um, and we'll go through a chart so you don't have to memorize any of this. Um, but all those are going in in February and into March, and then April hits and all your summer stuff. So all your tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, beans, starting to seed, um, zucchini, beans, zucchini, corn, winter squash, yeah, winter squash grown in summer, fall, winter squash. Um, so all your, almost all your summer stuff is actually fruit. The seed is inside the vessel. And um, your winter stuff is all actually vegetables where you're eating the vegetative plant. You're Just eating. like sugar. <laughs> Sugar is a vegetable. Uh, okay. Uh, when and growing... Lisa likes Marathon. Oh, I like a spring planted um, variety called Marathon because it can go, it'll start producing in about 60 days. It'll take you all through summer and you can still be harvesting broccoli into fall, which is, you cannot do, Marathon does not work that way in, um, is he stuck? I don't know. Does somebody need help? <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, <laughs> so, so your your fall planted broccoli and fall means August planted broccoli. Um, you're just gonna get your your main head and some side sprouts for sure, but then you're gonna be taking that out. Um, uh, and then one thing about California, I mean, the good thing and the bad thing is you, your tomatoes that you plant 
let's say April 15th, they're going to be producing through October, but you need that land in August to be planting all your fall stuff, your fall and winter stuff. So you have to sneak stuff in. You just have to go ahead and plant those broccolis at the base of the tomatoes. And um, so you're just always having to maximize your space by interplanting. Um, it's just the way it is. Nobody has enough space. So. And just get creative. Yeah, yeah. Um, what else? Oh, here's my favorite. Here's my favorite <laughs> seed chart. I brought it to the last class. I didn't bring it this time. But this is just go to UC Master Gardener and there's going to be at the end and I think everybody's going to get these slides anyway. Yeah. Um, they'll be emailed to you. Um, but the UC Master Gardeners from Santa Clara County um, have They're really good. Have a fabulous seed <laughs> chart. And Kathleen and I have looked at a lot of seed charts. This one is by far the best seed chart and it works for San Mateo. So you don't need to worry about that. It works for Santa Cruz. It works. It works everywhere. It works for San Francisco. It works everywhere in California, along the coast, this being the coast. Yeah. From probably Marin, no, Sonoma, actually, all the way down to Monterey. So do yourself a favor. This is going to tell you when to do what. And um, I'm going to sneak over here okay. for a second. Kathleen. The way to read this chart, let's take Let's take arugula. So you can start seeding. So these little dotted lines right here is when you can direct sow. Direct sow means you put the seed right in the garden. You don't put it into a tray. You just throw it out there. Yeah, with arugula you do. You could maybe start in February, but you can start direct sowing that in March or April or May. So right now you could go throw out a bunch of arugula seed. If you're gonna buy little seedlings, if you're going to a nursery and buy seedlings, you can transplant that February, March, April, May, and June, probably not, February, probably not. So um, thank you. Um, so uh, some things you can only direct sow, like let's say a root crop, you're not gonna be transplanting that. Um, and then some things kind of prima donna, the cauliflower, broccoli, tomatoes, peppers, you're gonna have to seed in trays and then pot them up, and then plant them out if you're gonna start everything from seed. You don't have to, but the nice thing of starting things from seed is the, the variety is amazing. There's probably a hundred different broccolis. There's certainly probably three or 400 different yeah, tomatoes. Um, so you, you just get a huge- Although if you ever wanna drive down to Santa Cruz around tomato time, um, San Lorenzo Nursery on River Street, right when you come off of Highway 17, yeah. Is a fabulous nursery. Yeah. And we should mention. And Half Moon Bay actually is really good too. Yeah. Half Moon Bay nursery is good. And Golden, I don't know. Is Golden good? Yeah. <laughs> expensive. Yeah. Yeah. And Half Moon Bay is pretty inexpensive. Yeah, and San Lorenzo good. is yeah. like cheap. And if you haven't bought your tomatoes, peppers, if you haven't bought any of that yet, which hopefully you haven't. Um, April 15th, the Master Gardeners are having their spring garden sale at the San Mateo County Fairgrounds. And that, um, um, I think it's that. Yeah, you're right. Because it's 92, it's like right over there. It's on Delaware and it's free parking. Um, and, and they have done a great job. Yeah, they have. So they have a ton, they have cucumbers, they have everything. Be you know, there's some things that are so easy, like beans, just go ahead and buy a package of bean seeds and just, and just put them in the ground pop them in um and like carrots don't buy carrots at a nursery because every cell pack has like 50 little carrots <laughs> and you would have to divide you would have to like tease out each little carrot make sure you kept that root straight and then put it in the ground keeping that root straight i mean that's insane yeah it's too much work just get some carrot seeds and sprinkle them down yeah exactly uh, all right, that's my favorite. That's your favorite. Uh, and I love this slide. <laughs> and I made this slide myself. Um, well, what I like about it is, um, so the warm stuff, which is stuff that's gonna be going in in the next couple of weeks. Um, and you can see they're almost all fruits. Cucumbers are fruit, tomatoes are fruit, uh, corn is grass, but almost everything is a fruit that's 
your warm season vegetables, your cool season vegetables, which we've been talking about a lot today, um, are all your true, you're eating the vegetative part of the plant. You're either eating the leaf, the stem, the immature flower bud. Um, and so those are true vegetables. There's some root, there's some root things in there too. But um, they overlap. You can see the warm stuff likes it between 65 and 85, and the cool stuff likes it 55 to 75. So they do overlap 65 to 75. And you're a little cooler here. I'm in Woodside, it's a little bit warmer than it is here. Um, but you're a little bit more temperate here. I saw a rose already blooming on yeah. one of the roses. I mean, which is amazing. I have we're, one in Santa Cruz blooming. Do you really? Yeah. So the more temperate climates, you can you can fudge a little bit more. Yeah. Um, and when we say don't plant legumes, we don't mean beans you're going to eat or peas you're going to eat. Yeah. If you're going to consume it, then it's not a cover crop. Yeah. Then then you're just eating it. But these are all broken down in families for you. So when we say um, rotate your crops, rotate your crops. If you don't do brassicas in the same place every year, and your your goosefoot family is going to get something, uh, the little leaf miner. And so you'll look at a spinach leaf or a chard leaf, and you're going to see this little trail where the little leaf miner is. And if you and they pupate and they drop in the soil and they live in the soil, and then they're going to come back. So if you just always are rotating your crops you're not gonna have issues with that or a buildup of. I love leaf miners. I know, cause they're cute. And <laughs> spittle bugs. Spittle bugs. It's some, I saw my first spittle bug yesterday. I yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Which means it's spring. When you see your first spittle bug, it's spring. <laughs> yeah, it's a good <laughs> sign. All right. Oh, we went through our tools. So I don't think we, there's my little basket. Yep. And there's everything in my basket. And there's the. the uh, there's the sharpener. The yeah. TM. DMT. DMT sharpener, the chat GBT. So I think we can skip that. Um, how to seed? Um, you know what, right after this, we'll do a little seeding uh, demonstration. Um, and if you're gonna buy seeds from the nursery, if you're gonna buy seedlings from the nursery, just make sure they're as fat as they are tall. So don't, don't buy ones that have been struggling to get light and they're all misshapen and, um, pop them out of the little cell, look at the roots, and you don't want them where the roots have been all, you know, yeah. going around and around and around. Um, so just buy nice, you know, buy nice seedlings if you aren't going to grow them yourself. And that's my son who just got into college. <laughs> <laughs> wow, he's smart. <laughs> I know he's Dookie Hauser. No, now he's 18. There he's like four or five or something like that. A long time ago. Well, we used to run a farm stand a long time ago. Uh, so those are the olden days. Um, okay. Next. I do have a question. Thanks. Um, we kind of talked about this a little bit. Um, so this is actually in Porto Valley. So it's not the farm, it's it's the garden. And have your stuff on hand. So I have my mulch on hand. I have soil on hand. I always have compost on hand. Uh, my irrigation's already in my beds. And um, these cages go over. Um, birds love like baby brassicas. And brassica, cabbage, cauliflower, kale. Um, no, Kathleen. Mm -hmm. Kohlrabi, kohlrabi, uh, turnips, rutabaga. Birds love little baby brassicas. So you do have to cover them at first, either with a floating row cover, uh, which we'll get to, or, or some sort of a cage. And so that just, keeps, that just keeps the birds off. So I just lay down my little brassicas and I just do do my little knife, pop them in and move on with my day. I can see some bok choy that got a little out of hand there. Um, but the, the main thing is be prepared, have your landscape staples, have, you know, have everything on hand because it just makes life so much easier. Okay. Um, we do not use a lot of inputs. We don't fertilize. We don't use pesticides, insecticides, herbicides. However, we do use sluggo. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll get into now how to protect things. Um, uh, IPM. Is um, integrated pest management. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but we don't. You know, I mean, you might get some of these things. You might get some leaf miners. You might get some aphids at the end of your brassica's life. Um, 
see what they do. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's just we don't we think it this past year we got some hornworms. So that horn worm is from the uh, tomato hornworm is from the garden. And <laughs> one of the master gardeners, she's really tall, and my tomato plants get really big. And it was a, I love <laughs> she just came upon it and they're gnarly and they yeah. have they have this big hook at the end. That's what they call them. They're kind of cute though. And they're so gushy, you know. <laughs> they're, they're they're really kind of a lovely bug. Did you so. give it to your chickens? Yeah. And then chickens, of course, love it. So slugs, any like grub. Oh my God, my chickens right now are yeah. going crazy over it. grubs. I know. Grubs are great. Yeah. Okay. Next slide. So, <laughs> so we do use sluggo. I mean, you wouldn't have to if you're going to put the time into hand picking off snails um, or slugs. But if you're not going to put the time, once I plant out brassicas after I water them in, I sprinkle it with sluggo. Um, and that's about our only input. It's, it's just brassicas. Yeah. Yeah. You don't need to do it with tomatoes they or anything love else. love brassicas. Yeah. That's my cat, Zazo. And um, floating row cover. Yeah. The floating row cover. And actually, what I like better than floating row cover is tool. Like you can just go to Joanne's Fabrics and it's like out of Bridal Veil material. It's called tool. And I just buy a whole bunch of that. And that's what I put over. Um, little seedlings that I have just planted. If I don't do that, you can buy something called floating row cover and A.M. Leonard would have it. Um, more light goes through the tool, like yeah. almost all the light goes through the tool. And this is just really to keep birds off of it um, because birds do love little tiny brassicas. Um, and they're flying. It's not gonna stop a rat or a squirrel or anything. Yeah. I mean, they're just gonna chew right through that. But I those rats and stuff don't get it till the broccoli is bigger. Um, so I wouldn't worry about those at that point. Okay, I think next. Trapping, this yeah. is just the reality of things. Um, so we trap uh, and we try, and that's Brian, our trapper in the, in the bottom right. Um, so he comes in on, he's a school teacher, but he's also a gardener. And he, um, he taught us all how to set traps uh, gopher traps, mostly gophers is our problem right now. We have a lot of gophers. Um, and you can just see, they got a whole row of chard and it's just like. <laughs> um, so it's, it's you know, you're like, thank you. Yeah. And I have found, so for Christmas last year, I asked Santa for a squirrel trap. <laughs> I must've been a very good girl. <laughs> Santa brought me a squirrel trap. But what I'm finding is I really like the square ones a lot better. Yeah. Um, you are allowed to kill, you are allowed to euthanize squirrels through putting them into a cooler and pumping CO2 into the cooler. You are not allowed to relocate them. They are live, these trap them live. You are not allowed to bring them to Fivoli and let them out. You, you can euthanize them on your property, but you're not allowed to take a furry animal off of your property. Um, and you have to have the stomach for that or you have to know somebody who has the stomach for it. And you can't shoot them. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I don't have the stomach for it, so I can't do it. Yeah. So I have to call my husband or, so yeah, it's too much for me. Now, however, I, when they're already dead, yeah. I don't have a problem. Yeah. Like the gopher trap, it kills it. Um, yeah, it's like, um, and then should I turn my husband again? No, go ahead. And then I put it in my compost pile. I mean, it's just a dead body, it's just carbon. It's, and then so I bury it in my compost pile, it decomposes. And Christine Jones puts kangaroos in her compost pile. <laughs> <laughs> She's my hero. Um, but if she can do it, so can I. <laughs> um, and then deer, we're deer fence. So I'm okay with deer. We probably don't have deer here. Yeah, I don't know, but I don't know. Um, okay, harvesting. Oh, we're getting to the end of our talk. I hate harvesting. <laughs> so we pretty much <laughs> do not plant cherry tomatoes anymore. <laughs> I mean, harvesting the just sweet one hundred. Sweet one hundred. Oh my God, those are the worst. Are even beans and peas. And yeah. Anyway, harvesting just put in your little mine harvesting takes a lot of time so it's we we figure one third of our gardening time is harvesting um but especially things that you're picking and the more you pick the more you get so yeah. the more you pick those beans the more beans you're going to get because they're trying to reproduce i like cauliflower 
Yeah, cauliflower is a one and done. <laughs> Beet, it's a one and done. So there's single serving vegetables and then there's vegetables that keep giving. So your single serving vegetables, you want to know what your next crop's going to be. Once you harvest all those cauliflowers, you want to make sure you have something to go right back into those crops. Broccoli can keep producing. It's going to get its central head and then it's going to get a whole bunch of side sprouts. So that can keep producing a long time. I tell my new clients I don't harvest. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's just a lot of time. So why we say cherry tomato? I mean, you're just harvesting and harvesting and harvesting. Arugula. Oh my God. Although arugula to me, that's kind of. Yeah, if you have weeds in it, then yeah. you have to take the weeds out. No, true that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so in an ideal world, it, you know, you take a beet out, you plant another beet seed. And so, you know, the single serving vegetables, what I like to do, what I aspire to do is you have, let's say, six cauliflower plants, and then two weeks later, you plant another six, two weeks later, you plant another. So you don't have 18 huge cauliflower heads all at the same time. Um, so for single serving, you try to do a successive sowing. Um, for plants that keep giving, almost all your summer stuff keeps giving. Um, you don't have to do a successive sowing. Uh, and that's from the farm stand days, actually. Although zucchini, I plant zucchini twice. Yeah, zucchini and cucumbers, I find cucumbers get bitter. Yeah. So I actually do cucumbers three times really? during the growing season. Like yeah. halfway through summer, I plant another zucchini just because they get, they just get gross. Yeah, true. And then, I mean, one zucchini can feed the entire neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. that's true. <laughs> so, <laughs> also, just be careful and plant what you like to eat. Yeah. If you do not eat beets, don't plant beets yeah. or, you know, whatever. But, or if you don't like those patty pan oh summer squash yeah don't yeah. plant them <laughs> yeah. and if you don't like zucchini that much don't yeah although my spouse told me she loves zucchini and for me the hardest part with zucchini is they're green it's hard to see them when they're little because yeah. the plant's prickly and it's just I thought, okay i'll get these golden zucchini yeah she's like those aren't zucchini <laughs> no, they are they zucchini. taste exactly the no, same. those are not zucchini. <laughs> zucchini really don't taste that much anyway i know there's no flavor <laughs> this is just zucchini i should have just painted them green <laughs> yeah we're gonna get the chirpy out uh okay <laughs> next uh weather oh you know i put this, this in yeah, I put this in because we're either it seemed like we're having atmospheric oh, rivers yeah. or we're having drought yeah. and we're in climate change. So that's why it's back to, uh, you know, roots in the ground instead yeah. of boots on the ground. So it's just keep keep things growing in your soil at all times year round 365. And if you if you have an area in your garden, in your landscape garden, mulch. Yeah, mulch. just you know, get some nice decorative mulch and put that down. It'll suppress the weeds. It'll protect your soil. You'll need less water in the summer. Yeah, they, I mean, not I personally throw seeds in my entire yard. Yeah, so because my spouse problems. doesn't know, <laughs> <laughs> but because she's not a gardener. But if you if you don't want to plant everywhere in your yard. Put, put mm -hmm. down mulch and you can get a lot of free mulch right now yeah um there's a lot of arborists with wood chips there's a lot of arborists with wood chips. you can just go online if you just google free wood chips there's a little form that pops up if you want free wood chips but you have to take down a whole truck full um and if you do buy mulch um don't buy the mulch that's been sprayed a yeah, color colored just buy natural mulch yeah and shredded redwood bark tends to be hydrophobic. It repels water. Yeah, yeah, but the mulch, gorilla hair. Yeah, what they call it. Gorilla hair. Yeah, yeah don't get that. Yeah. Um, so the weather drought, uh, unpredictable. Uh, Mission farm. We had no puddling. I think I already said that. Okay, next slide. We have a couple more. Oh, this is where we cost. Oh, so first yeah. we're going to save you a hundred dollars, and then we're going to cost you a thousand dollars. So. Um, <laughs> We are? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we are. It's a new uh, to say you hundred dollars. So Kathleen and I get called out on consultations and I'd say nine out of ten times. Yeah. They're like, oh, I can't grow anything, you know. And so we go and it's because their bone blow person or they themselves are blowing the soil. So the soil is like concrete. They're blowing the leaves out from under the trees. 
Yeah, or just just everywhere in their garden, they're blowing yes. the entire thing. So there's no mulch anywhere. Um, and, and it is literally, you could not tell the difference between a, a driveway and their soil. It's just so dead. They have killed every single microbe in their soil. So, um, so that just saved you a hundred dollars because you don't have to have us come out and tell you. <laughs> to, and their vegetable beds in shade. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, usually that. So, so just keep everything covered, either with a plant or with mulch. Um, don't blow your soil. Here's where we're going to cost you a thousand dollars. So that's our favorite arborist in the world, Kevin Raftery. Oh yeah, he's my hero too. He's my hero, and um, that's him giving a demonstration at Mission Farm. Um, unless you really know what you're doing with, and Kathleen's an ISA certified arborist, and she, you don't hire Kevin, I do, um, because I don't have time. Yeah. Um, I've done a lot of pruning in my life, and Kathleen, I've taken a lot of classes. You see how nice my peach tree looks. Yeah. I mean, if you really know what you're doing and you've taken a lot of classes and you're really confident in your pruning skills, go ahead and prune. But if you can answer no to any of those, hire somebody. Well, hire Kevin. Don't hire anybody. Um, it, it's worth it to have things correctly pruned. Um, and Kevin's protege is good. He's just expensive. He's in Las Gatos. Yeah. Steve Young. Yeah. Yeah. Steve Young. But Kevin's terrific. And you can just like Google his name and figure out. But he, he's really, really good. He's super busy and you have to be extremely persistent to get on his schedule. But he does it. Uh, Mythbusters don't pull weeds. Don't fertilize. Um, February, National Weeding Month. Cut off the tops of weeds. Chop and drop your weeds. Uh, okay, next slide. I think we're done at, oh, have fun. There's me. <laughs> have fun. <laughs> There's a cauliflower of me with some other master gardeners and be, you know, and then I use my garden as my garden at home as like a grocery store or, you know, like a refrigerator. So I like, what's for dinner that night? I go out to the garden. I figure out what's for dinner that night. So, and then we have chickens. So uh, there will be times where, you know, everything's from the garden that we're eating. Uh, okay. Your chickens too? No, we don't eat our chickens. Hmm. We just eat our egg, their eggs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, next slide. I think we're into, oh, questions. Is it sinful to plant cherry tomatoes in a large pot? No. no. Can you repeat the question? Oh, so the question is, is it sinful to um, plant cherry tomatoes in a large pot? No, not at all. Oh, okay. I yeah. just, it's just a lot of work to harvest a cherry tomato. So I oh, tend no, not you just to... walk by when you're out in the garden. You just pluck one and it goes right in. <laughs> That's my spouse that sent me to go get some blueberries and to the grocery store. No, um, I have uh, like four blueberry bushes in my backyard. Oh, and I just sat there and they were so ripe and they were so delicious. <laughs> and I came back in, I said, Oh, we don't have any yet. <laughs> uh, I thought you were gonna say she sent you to the grocery store to get blueberries and you came home with blueberry plants. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's see if we have um, let's see if we have some we have a question here. Yeah, question. What do you use to support your tomato when they grow yeah. several feet? You know, we get we bought this heart, this wire that is has a hole about you want to answer this? Well, yeah, I mean you could probably go back to a slide that um but it's about this tall. Yeah. It, it's it's fencing, it's bull fencing. And then you take a, a gigantic piece of it and you have to do some math. It's like 3.14 times, whatever. And we make a big circle out of it. And it's, it's not bull fencing. Bull fencing is, is well, more something solid. like that. Yeah. It, it's a fencing that you get at the like home Depot. It is I a guess. fencing material and it's about eight feet tall. And for every plant, for every, every tomato, yeah. Yeah, but there's yeah. different ways you do not have, I mean, that's a little more labor intensive way to cage a tomato. You can also, if you're gonna be really good about pruning them, we didn't get into pruning tomatoes, but we can tell you quickly how to do it. You can grow it on a single pole, um, but every time, here's the stem of the tomato, I'm the stem and these are the branches. Every time you see a little sprout right here, right in the apex of the stem and the leaf, just click it off, just snap it off. And then you can grow a tomato like around a single pole. Yeah. And that's way 
cheaper way to do it. And, um, but you have to be on top of it because that tomato is just gonna go. And actually each of those little things you clip off, if you wanna root it, you can root it and grow another tomato plant and it'll be a clone. Or you could do like the dry farmers. We just went to a dry farm tomato conference in Santa Cruz and they don't stake them at all. They just let them go on the ground mm -hmm. and, and be put on the ground. Yeah. And yeah, there's just the let them trail around on the ground. Yeah. There's determinate and indeterminate. So you could also buy ones that aren't gonna, the indeterminate just keep growing and growing forever, but the determinate are only gonna get a certain size, like aroma or something, they're only gonna get a certain size and then they're just gonna stay. And so you could have those, those cages that you see like at a nursery, they'd be fine for a determinate tomato. They're not gonna be fine for an indeterminate. Still, still. Yeah, cause they can get. Yeah, I'm gonna actually this year, I'm gonna try to grow mine along a fence. Oh, okay. In Boulder Creek. Yeah. And see. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to try all sorts of methods. I think we have some Zoom questions too, so let's take a couple of those. Can, sure. can you? I can't read them, Kathy. If you could. Oh, well, this one says I start zucchini seeds in a sunny window a few weeks ago. True leaves are just coming out. The question is, can I transplant them and set them deeper, like tomato seedlings, or should I start over? No, you can you can transplant them. She, you could transplant them or you could also go ahead and just, um, I, it's a tiny bit early, but go ahead and transplant them into your garden. They don't really like being transplanted all that much. So I wouldn't double, yeah. I wouldn't transplant it from that to a, did she say four <clears throat> inch? Oh, it's already in a four inch. Oh yeah, no, put it in the ground. Put it in the ground from here. Yeah. Yeah, okay. go ahead right now. All right, next one. Today. When do you plant a cover crop? Oh, always. <laughs> <laughs> all the time. Oh, yeah. Um, so there's this misconception that you can only cover crop in fall, but that's not true. You can, if it's irrigated, like most of our vegetable gardens are irrigated, we cover crop at least three times a year. Every time we put in a new crop, we're throwing out cover crop seeds. Or I, I throw out seeds and I put a cheap ass little timer on my faucet and I have it run for three minutes every six hours for a few days. And as soon as they're up and growing, you turn fine. it off. Yeah, yeah. I turn it off. A, a seed needs to be moist and warm to germinate. Yeah. Okay. Next one. Uh, I thought you couldn't plant brassicas and tomatoes next to one another. No, no actually, you just the opposite. Yeah. Um, no, you can. In fact, there's research that tomato uh, brassicas, specifically broccoli, kill the verticillium that will attack your tomato. So you, you want them next to each other. Yeah, the question might be based in uh, the brassica family is antagonistic to mycorrhizal fungi and tomatoes are not antagonistic to mycorrhizal fungi, but that doesn't matter. They, they find their way. They coexist just fine. Yeah. yeah. And then powdery mildew on a squash plant. And um, oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> You, I, you can hose it down during the day. In fact, in the morning. In the morning and then let the sun hit it. Yeah. It's just, a, it's like a little bit of fungi. Like, or you plant a new one. I don't, I'm always kind of a little happy to see, um, to see it like on a zucchini plant because I kind of want that zucchini plant to slow down a little bit. <laughs> I, so it, it, it has never bothered me. Um, so I, yeah. I mean, I personally wouldn't do anything, but you could get the leaf wet in the morning, let the yeah. sun dry it, and yeah. that'll um, that'll help control it. Powdery mildew. Can, can you read out the questions? Of, oh, oh yeah, sorry. sorry. Yeah. And the next one is: Do you ever use a soil tester? Uh, I did a long time ago. Have you tested your soil? No, never. No. But I, I might do it again because um, there's a soil team in the Master Gardeners and they want me to test my soil to see how much organic matter I have in it. So I, I might I might do it again. Um, a long, long, long time ago when I was first gardening, I was concerned about the chemicals in my soil. Um, if I had enough nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium and and then it was actually Terry Lingso who just was like, <laughs> you need to, don't worry about chemistry, worry about biology. Yeah. If you have good biology in your soil, if you have good, if you see worms in there, then you know you have microbes and you know you have all the stuff that's going to be feeding that plant. So I completely 
took off my chemistry hat. I used to have a slide on it yeah. where I went from being a chemist to a biologist. And really all you need to do is worry about the life in your soil. You don't need to worry about if the nutrients are there. The life in the soil is going to find the nutrients and bring it to your plant. Do not fertilize, please. It, you are then unemploying all of those microbes. They're yeah. going to give up. They're going to join the unemployment lines. Well, they're going to die. <laughs> and they're going to die, which is sad. And then all that photosynthesis that's happening with that plant and all those carbon that they're pumping into the soil to feed those microbes and keep those microbes alive. And you've just killed your microbes. And they quit pumping it in then by fertilizing. If there's, if there's no need, they don't pump it into the soil. Yeah, so it, it, it's very bad. Yeah, I used to think fertilizer was like garlic, the more the better. Yeah. When I first started gardening, you know, like a plant didn't look great. Oh, I'm gonna throw some fertilizer on it. <laughs> you know, now I still use a lot of garlic. Yeah. But now, <laughs> now it's now, compost. Now you know. Now yeah. I know better. Yeah. Where do you get your mulch? My mulch, I get it from San Lorenzo Nursery in the two cubic foot bags. Um, the J and B soil conditioner. Well, my mulch mulch like chips. Oh, I just get I, I don't know what brand it is, but it's like eight dollars a bag. But you could go to Lingso and you can just um, yeah. put it in yourself in a bag yourself, and um, it's a lot less expensive that way. Where, where do you get that? At Lingso in San Carlos, um, right by the airport or by the waste station. Yeah. And they also have really high quality compost. Um, so if you're not making your own compost, and it's less expensive when you bake it yourself. Um, so if I were ever to run out of compost, that's where I would get my compost. Can you repeat that, the, the name of the nursery? It's L-Y-N-G-S-O, Lingso. Which one's good? Can this be given away, Kathleen? Yeah. Okay. I just found it out of the garbage can. Oh, God, it's so pretty. <laughs> I think it's like California <laughs> Natives. Yeah. I think it's California Natives. Are there more questions? From, uh, I'm curious, you haven't uh, mentioned at all waste management. They offer mm. Yeah. Um, okay, it's not that right. You know, for your non edibles, you can have this. I think it's fine. Thank you. For your edibles, I'm hesitant to use their stuff. I just know what I put in my green bin is stuff I don't put in my compost pile. I put in disease. If somebody uses um, certain herbicides or chemical fertilizers on their lawn and they cut that grass and, you know, it just, it's a question mark to me. So I don't put it on my edibles. I think it'd be fine on your roses, but unless you eat your roses. <laughs> unless you're making rose hip tea or yeah. something. But yeah, I, I wouldn't put that on my edibles. Yeah. <clears throat> and one more question on that. Oh. What kind of shears do you, the little boxes in the way, do you recommend for chopping? You know, I have ARS and I love them. Do you have like the blade that comes out and you're going like yeah, that? Okay. Like head shears. Like a head shear, yeah. 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 Um, I mean, I just use my hand pruners. Yeah. But um, yeah, you could use a head shear for it. It depends. It depends how precise you're being and if you have other things growing. Like you have broccoli growing in your cover crop and you're taking down your cover crop. Yeah. You have to just be careful that you don't also chop your broccoli. Um, yeah. Yeah, I have, if I'm taking an entire row out, I actually use an electric hedge trimmer and I just, and it so. saves a lot of time. You could also use a weed whacker. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Take so, away your irrigation lines. Yeah, mm -hmm. anything that's leaving the roots in the ground is what you want to do. Is that the last question? No, were you going to do something? With oh, we'll do a quick seed demonstration. I mean, this isn't, no. Um, do you want to seed some lettuce? Sure. Now, I mean, if you were seeding, this would have no plants. I just wanted to, like, the, this is some broccoli that we planted on 323, so it's about a week old or something. Those are the little cotyledon leaves. These are the little, the little okay. seed leaves. Now, um, one of my gardeners did this, but you just do one seed per hole, <laughs> and now you would never seed something that's already germinated and up. 
you would never seed into the same thing. So now you're just going to have to use your imagination and pretend there was nothing in here. And oh, lettuces. No. Ah, lettuce is the one seed that I probably don't want to do. So lettuce is something <laughs> called a. Uh, Oh, I want to say photovoltaic. Oh, lettuce lettuce yeah, needs you know, light to germinate. Okay. And so you just put a lettuce seed on top. You're not going to cover up that seed. Um, so lettuce, I probably, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do in these trays. But if you had anything else, I, I would. Here. Perfect. Okay. Because the rest are all direct selling. Beets, carrots. Yeah. So this is a little sugar snap pea. Again, I would um, direct sow it. I would direct sow it. I wouldn't put it in here. So in, in these, I've started my tomatoes in here, my peppers in here. I've started broccoli, cauliflower, kale. I've started a lot of things in these trays. I use a lot of these trays. A sugar snap pea, but this is a great one for demonstrating. A, yeah, sugar, huh? a sugar snap pea, I would just direct sow because it's so much easier. So why? Why put it in here and transplant it is too much fuss. But so I won't, I won't sow it, but I, you want to plant a seed the same depth. Oops, here's the camera. You want to plant a seed the same depth as big as a seed is. So this seed is quarter inch, let's call that. So you're gonna put it down a quarter of an inch. The the biggest mistake I see people doing with seeding is they put the seed way too deep. They think the seed needs to go down an inch or two inches or three inches or four inches. And like a broccoli seed or a cauliflower, kale, cabbage, it's a teeny tiny seed. They just go down a quarter of an inch. So, and then some seeds like lettuce is one of them. That's just gonna go on top. You don't need to cover that seed up. So um, don't poke that seed. I've seen so many people do it where they, they make this like huge, huge hole in their soil and you know, it's just like they plant trees. Yeah, and so they they put it, you know, with, whoa, you know, they really get that seed in there. Well, that seed only has so much energy in it. It, is, it has enough energy to put a root down out of the same little navel that it has. Put a root down and put a little sprout up. And if if it has to keep going for another inch after it puts that little sprout up, it just gives up. So that's why you don't do it. Um, don't do it as deep as a lot of people. Yeah, it's like. It's like people planting trees. So, yeah. Um, I think that is it for the. Did you put one in? I didn't because um, really what I wanted to, the thing I wanted to get across is don't put it too deep. Yeah. Okay. So I feel like I got that across. How come you have little broccolis? Well, I just I just seeded them because. Um, well, the one thing I got for seed. Oh. <laughs> I'm talking about oh, broccoli time. Oh, question in back. Do tomato seeds need light to germinate? No. You can do them in darkness. Do tomato seeds? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Sorry to repeat the question. Yeah. Do tomato seeds need light to germinate? No. But with a tomato seed or anything that's a summer vegetable, what I would do is I have a heating pad. Um, <laughs> this would not be recommended by PG&E. If you don't have a heating pad and you don't want to go buy one, I've also used electric blankets. But and then cover it with plastic and but they want they want bottom heat and they want that soil to be warm. I didn't bring a chart with me. Like they probably want their soil to be about 85. And right after that germinate, so you'd put them on the bottom heat. Um, they don't need light to germinate. Um, but right after it does germinate, take it off the bottom heat and put it. Oh yeah, that's why I brought it, Kathleen. <laughs> So when, let's say I was seeding this whole tray with tomatoes and I was doing, you know, six different kinds of tomatoes, I would seed the whole thing. I save the inside of my cereal box and that's what this is, a piece of plastic. Oh, I'll put it in front of that. And then I don't want to smush my broccoli, but then I put this, I bottom water this. So I put this actually in a cement tray. I bottom water it and I top water it. So it is heavy, you can feel it. I watered it yesterday. Super, super heavy because I bottom water and top water. You do not water anymore. You put this over, you tuck it like that. Pretend there's nothing that's germinated in here. Put it on bottom heat and check it in about three days. And as soon as you see the first one, this is 72 tray. Um, 
after you see the first one germinate, take it off of the bottom heat. It means the other ones have germinated. They just haven't broken the soil yet. Take it off the bottom heat. And then the tomatoes are tricky because you really want to start them in February. We don't have enough sun in February. You know, then they need light and they need a lot of light. They need eight to 10 hours of light when they're little tiny babies. Um, you can bring them outside during the day, but during the day in February, they're probably only getting, even in pure sun, they're probably only getting eight hours of light. So for tomato, for anything, any summer stuff, you're gonna want lights. Um, grow lights. Grow lights. Like a in the olden days, you just, what I bought it was shop lights with a warm bulb and a cold bulb. <laughs> And that's what I did. You can't buy shop lights anymore. Really? I don't know. Yeah, life has changed and you can't buy shop lights anymore. Oh. So, um, and at this time of year, I'm just putting them outside now. They're getting pretty close to going into the garden. You know, in a couple more weeks, I'll go ahead and plant those out. Late April, early May, those will all go into the garden. Um, yeah, anything else about seeding? Any more questions? Sure. Okay. Good. Right, good. Done. Well, thank you, Kathleen and Lisa, for Certainly. a great presentation. I yeah. hope everybody's ready to go we and work in their garden. Um, in a day or two, you're going to receive um, in, an email with a copy of the presentation. Um, it's been recorded. And um, we also um, will include an evaluation form. So we'd appreciate if you could give us suggestions or um, tell us what you like, what you didn't like, so to help us with future programs. Um, next month, we are having a, um, a seminar on popular houseplants, and that will also be Master Gardeners are going to present that. So um, you can go online if you're interested and sign up. Um, so thanks again to the Putnam sisters and sure. Kevin and Kathy for the technical help. And uh, yeah. And Sue and Ben, the fellow education committee members. <laughs> okay, well, we appreciate you coming and uh, yeah, hope to see you at future presentations. Cool. Thank you.